see how wide you can come in and put these in. Uh, the Mars here. Okay.
that would attract both AAAS students that were primarily interested in history and sociology and political science with Selinger students who were primarily interested in entrepreneurship and business. And our idea was to try to find a way to teach the history, the sociologic, and the political ramifications of anti-black policies in Baltimore, like redlining, as well as how to explore new ways to fund emerging businesses from these communities. And we thought, who better to tell these stories and to share a firsthand experience of living in these communities and creating solutions to address these policies than the entrepreneurs themselves. So last week, last year, uh, we were awarded a grant from the United States Jesuit Business School deans to create five learning modules that are centered around the short films that you are going to see tonight. These films depict the stories and experiences of these entrepreneurs in the communities that are at the center of their work. And they bring the, that experience not just to Loyola classrooms, but by design and what we hope are to classrooms throughout the country. And we're excited to show these films to you for the first time in public tonight. Um, a project like this involves a lot of people, so I, I hope you indulge a few of the thank yous. There are a lot of people to thank. Um, I want to be sure to recognize the collaborators and co-creators on this project. In addition to Renita is Jay Dunmore from Great Com Studios, who is our director of photography, Jesse Goldstein, who many of you know from our Office of Digital Teaching and Learning, who was the film editor, um, Father Tim Brown in the Office of Mission Integration that not only supported the project financially, but um, Father Brown has also been very instrumental in reaching out to his connections in the Jesuit community to make sure that this work is, is well used and well recognized. And certainly I need to thank Jen Sullivan, um, who works with us at the Simon Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship for putting a lot of this together tonight. When we, when we started to, to talk to the entrepreneurs, we were looking for entrepreneurs that were not only creating companies that were addressing redlining and historically anti-black structures, but also that had a personal story or connection to their venture, a lived experience. <coughs> We met Terrell and his company, Project Own, through the Baltimore's Accelerator a couple of years ago. And as you'll see, Terrell and his family not only demonstrate an amazing inspiration for the value of creating intergenerational wealth through the access of mortgage loans, but they also provide quite a personal introduction to important anti-black experiences of the 20th century, like the Great Migration, the forced displacement of families, and red line. Our first um, our first story tonight is Terrell Dixon and Project Home. Baltimore is a city known for its inner harbor and a compelling grit and charm that sets it apart from neighboring cities like Washington or Philadelphia. In the first half of the 20th century, black families were dispossessed of millions of acres of farmland and waterfront property through violence and legal and illegal forms of loan servicing and coercion. This led to the displacement and migration of over 6.5 million Southern blacks in search of industrial jobs in Northern and Midwestern American cities like Baltimore. During the Great Migration, Baltimore's population exploded from 560,000 in 1910 to over 950,000 in 1950. Terrell Dixon is the founder of Project OWN, a startup focused on helping families overcome barriers to home ownership. In the mid-1920s, his great-grandmother Lucille arrived in Baltimore as part of that great migration. My great-grandmother Lucille was born in southern South Carolina in 1922 and moved here with his child in the mid-1920s. And like a lot of black families during that time, uh, you know, came here looking for opportunities that, that didn't exist in the South. Um, and so her family ended up settling in South Baltimore, uh, what is now the Sharpman Hall neighborhood, and you know lived there until the 1970s. Um, and at that point, uh, the city decided to build uh, what was then known as the East-West Highway. Um, it's since become you know highways, stadiums, condos, parks, uh, but the existing community that was there no longer exists. And so you know. Different parts of the family went separate ways. My great grandmother Lucille ended up in this house, uh, what is now you know, known as the Shipley Hill neighborhood, 
of what Baltimore um, sometime in the early, early 1970s. The forced displacement of Lucille's family from their home in Sharp Leadenhall was part of a common policy response to the Great Migration that cities like Baltimore used to segregate black families in the name of urban renewal. In 1967, the city of Baltimore created a condemnation line through the center of Sharp Leadenhall that was then used to buy up and displace 3,000 neighborhood residents. Those families were then scattered into hyper-segregated communities like Cherry Hill to make way for an east-west highway that was never fully constructed. The families that were displaced from those developments you know, were given a small check and you know, told to find new places to live, right? And you know, I think she, was, she felt fortunate to find this house, but she never thought to buy it. When I was speaking to uh, my great aunt, Bonita, about it, uh, her reasoning was just, it just never occurred to her. That wasn't something uh, that people in her position, working class, black, single head of household, woman, would have ever thought to do, but it sold for $10,000. You know, for that to be the barrier of entry, uh, that really speaks to, you know, why we founded Project Doan and why we want to create a, a different trajectory for future generations of black households. For Lucille and Vanessa, the barriers to home ownership in the 1970s included anti-black home and neighborhood covenants and a racially motivated collusion between the federal government, banks, and real estate agents to draft residential security maps. These maps put red lines around predominantly black neighborhoods that restricted investment and access to capital for potential black homeowners. I think the legacy of redlining is just you know, very real today. When you look at the gap between black and white home ownership, you know, which is currently you know, roughly 30%, um, it really starts you know, generations ago. I mean, people like my great grandmother lived in homes that they could have afforded to buy. Um, would have made perfect sense for them to do so given the fact that they lived there and that's their home. Um, but they just never had the opportunity, either because of you know the legacy of predatory and discriminatory lending. And when the legacy of that is still very real today. Um, and it's you know chronic known that's what we try to do, right? We try to work with folks to overcome those barriers. Not only has the legacy of redlining created a stark disparity in home ownership between black and white families, in effect, it has made it almost impossible for black families like Terrell's to accumulate and pass on generational wealth. I was born in Baltimore. Um, you know, my mother was a, was a single parent um, to three children, and we lived in you know, the Mount Vernon neighborhood, and we suffered from housing insecurity. The economic benefits of homeownership are pretty straightforward. It's the, the biggest tool for, for wealth creation for most middle class households, and you know, that's obviously important. But, you know, I think equally important is creating safe and stable and healthy homes um, for, for folks to grow up in. And, you know, if you can do that at a meaningful scale, then you can start to see healthy communities begin to thrive again. Who is the project own client or customer? Who is it that you're trying to help and what are you trying to help them do? So our service is technically available to anyone who's looking to overcome a barrier to home ownership, uh, whether that be credit, savings, uh, we're just getting more familiar with the process. Uh, but in practice, 90% of our clients are black women. Uh, on average, their income is about 30% of their union income. Uh, so these are really you know, working class black families. Uh, they're often single parents in a household. Um, and frankly, they're, they're very similar to my great grandmother Lucille or, or my own mother, right? Who are, who are working, making a way each month paying rent and who are you know, interested in exploring what homeownership uh, could mean for them. What kind of experiences have your clients shared with you that's helped impact how Project Own has grown or, or changed? And a lot of working class households uh, don't have the luxury of taking off in the middle of the day and you know, finding parking downtown and, and meeting for it an hour, hour and a half every month. And so that really created an, uh, an incentive for us to digitize our services so that folks can meet over the phone, via video, or in person, uh, when and where made sense for them. Another thing we've learned is to not make assumptions. And so we sort of dug into the data and found that 92% you know, of people who weren't making it to the intake phase uh, were failing to do so because of documentation requirements. If that is the barrier to entry, then our job is to help people overcome that. We eliminated the documentation requirement. Uh, and in the first two weeks of that change, there was a 400% increase 
of folks who are matriculating to the intake meeting. And on an annualized basis, that's going to create over 275 additional households who receive the service. Like a lot of new startups, Project Own grew from the personal experience of the founder and an unmet opportunity in the marketplace. And it continues to grow and scale based on the needs and user experience of its customers and stakeholders. So our focus right now is to just prove at a meaningful scale that this work can be done differently, right? And once you prove that it can be done differently in a way that's cost effective and scalable, then we think it's really just a matter of getting more folks bought in because you know technology scales pretty easily. It's you know systems and you know getting folks to change the way that they approach this work, which we think is going to be the, the big challenge. So you're a new entrepreneur and you have a business and you've talked about scalability. You even had your some iterations um, to your company. How would Project Own define success for all those clients? So our mission as an organization is to equalize access to home ownership for Black Americans, and we really think ultimately we want to extend that to all Americans, right? So we're envisioning a world in which no matter where you live in the country, no matter what your income, your zip code, your race, your gender, you have access to the support and the tools you need to access home ownership. And you know, that means eliminating the information barrier. It means making sure that people have the support in terms of credit and budgeting, right? Because we just think in, in the 21st century, those shouldn't be the barriers preventing folks from accessing home ownership. By removing some of those historic barriers to home ownership, the success of Project Own may reach beyond the individual homeowners and extend into communities like Shipley Hill. I think ultimately what we envision is community ownership being really a viable pathway forward for community redevelopment. You know, unfortunately, uh, historically, when communities like this do redevelop, it's often what you know folks refer to as gentrification. It's someone externally who infuses capital with the idea that someone else externally will come and live there. And what we envision is folks who are rooted in the community, or maybe folks who have historical ties to the community. For folks like that, to have the opportunity to buy into their community, to rehabilitate it, and to see it grow and flourish, we can't sort of undo the past. Right, but you know, Project Down is really envisioning a better future, right? And, and we think community ownership is really central to that. What do you enjoy the most about being a new entrepreneur of a, of a new venture that's making an impact in your city? Mm -hmm. So for me, the best part of, of this experience has been the ability to follow clients throughout their own journeys. Um, so one client in particular comes to mind She's actually our second client. Uh, she's been in the program about 18 months at this point. But when we first met her, um, she told us the story of how she lost her home during the financial crisis. Um, she had a stable job. She had a variable rate mortgage that was about $600 a month. Um, and she had a dispute with the bank. And she said she just, you know, she didn't really understand what was going on. It wasn't necessarily about the amount of money, uh, but it was just a miscommunication. And she came home one day and there was a lock on her door, um, and the bank had, had taken her house. Right? And then fast forward to the present day, right? and she's you know, overpaying for rent. Um, she's still very much working on repairing her credit and, and just rehabilitating and rebuilding her financial life. Fast forward 18 months, and she's increased her credit score by 97 points. Right? And I think the thing that made me most exciting is in our last meeting, Right, she asked if she could invite her daughter. Um, and it reminds me of, you know, my grandmother or my great aunt. For her to not only be going through this first process late in her life, but to be engaging her daughter and helping prepare future generations uh, of black households to have that sort of intergenerational opportunity. Um, that's really at the heart of what we're trying to do, right? And so to see that actually play out um, over the course of, of 18 months. Stuff like that is really what makes you know, the, the work worth doing. It's especially challenging for black entrepreneurs to secure the capital and investment to start a socially minded company from funders who seldom look like them or share their life experiences. Terrell describes pitching an idea rooted in his own life story to funders who may not personally relate to the mission of Project Own. I think my biggest takeaway from the fundraising experience and you know, connecting with other uh, entrepreneurs of color, 
um, in various fields, right? I think they've expressed similar uh, stories, which is that I think venture capitalists and, and other funders sort of intuitively ask themselves, can I relate to this product or idea, right? Which makes sense. Um, but when you're doing something that is very rooted in your own experiences or the experiences of your community, um, there's sort of the limit to that empathy, right? And I think um, on the funding side, if, if the shifting, if the thinking shifts more towards, you know, can I personally relate to this experience or how does this tool or this product meet the needs of a community, right? And if I can't necessarily um, relate directly to that experience, right? What work do I have to do either to listen to folks who can or you know, to educate myself about you know, different folks in the communities um, in order to really sit in their shoes to the extent possible? And there's a lot of pressure in that world, right? Because you have a two minute pitch and you know, you're trying to explain a very rich and detailed personal story and how it relates to your product in 30 seconds, right? And, and inevitably, in order to do that, I think, you know, myself and other uh, founders of color, we end up sort of diluting that story, right? And distilling it into something that's easily digestible, but not necessarily reflective of the true breadth of our, of our backgrounds and experiences. So, um, yeah, I think that that effort to, to understand and recognize their limits is a goal of all. some time to the art of collecting them. And fortunately, um, we have some great resources here at Loyola, David Carey and the Loyola College, uh, Jenny Kniff at the Loyola Notre Dame Library, and even people out in the community, like Aaron Henkin, who collects stories in his podcast, The Block, that were able to provide some key insights. And one of those was that the narrator will take you where their story will go. In this first video with Terrell, he took us not only on the journey of his great aunt, but on his own journey and experience walking into that room with investors that don't look like him and do not share his life experiences. And this became very quickly a theme throughout the series. Our second entrepreneur was Ashley Williams. We also met um, Ashley uh, through our Baltimore's program as she was starting her company, Infinite Focus Schools, that has since iterated into the company Klein. And as you'll see, Ashley took this on a compelling story about the importance of historical trauma and social and emotional learning. But you will, what you will also see is how Ashley used her experience as a Baltimore City public school teacher and their, her experience as a black woman entrepreneur to bring the work and to highlight what we need to do as investors before we go into those pitch meetings with the entrepreneurs. Our second video is Ashley Williams of Klein. In 2006, Ashley Williams started teaching at the new Southwest Baltimore Charter School. It was here that she first recognized the importance of social and emotional learning for students and teachers confronting more than just the stress and challenges within their classrooms. Students need relationships. That's the very first thing. As a teacher, when you walk into the classroom, you bring in all of that information that you learned at university. You're bringing science, pedagogy, you're bringing lesson planning. But none of that matters unless you can look a student in the eye and connect to their heart. How would you define social-emotional development and mindfulness? It's a good question. 
So social emotional learning, emotional intelligence is most often defined as the ability to sort of monitor your own emotional experience, to identify what you're experiencing, I'm having this emotional experience, and to also recognize the patterns and behaviors that result because of the emotional experience that you have identified with. And then the third thing is to be able to move through whatever emotional experience shows up. Principal Joseph Eldridge describes why these skills are so important for students who are struggling to learn amidst historic levels of anxiety and depression. There's a lot of stress in coming into a room and not knowing anything. And that's how students come into the room every day. They don't know what we're going to teach them, they, especially if we're introducing something new. So social emotional learning gives students that kind of, a, it's a tool for them to use when they get anxious or overwhelmed. It helps them to identify and navigate through their emotions and how they exist in, in, in the uh, environment and their, with their peers. Well, instead of reacting when somebody steps on my shoe with violence, I've developed new pathways through the practice daily of meditation, of mindfulness. I can choose another choice. I can take a deep breath and say, hey, you know what? Things happen. This is not personal. While its value is understood, a gap still exists between the acknowledged need for social and emotional learning and the teacher's limited capacity to implement. Teachers, 93% of teachers believe that social emotional learning is as important as academic learning, but only 22% of them feel prepared to teach it. So there's a huge gap. Schools are already doing things to teach social emotional learning, but the people, the stakeholders who are responsible for distributing that content to young people don't feel empowered because a math teacher is not a mindfulness instructor. A math teacher is a math teacher. The teachers are really running the program. They're essential to the program. And because they're essential to the program and on the front lines, it's important that we equip teachers to be able to give, not only to be able to give students that social emotional toolkit that they need, but also to build out teachers' social emotional toolkit. Ashley described one of the fundamental barriers to teaching social and emotional education. It goes back to like their training they're not prepared to teach it for their young people. They're also not prepared to practice self-care as a teacher. All they're taught is pedagogy. They're taught pedagogy. So it's a huge component missing from the structure of teaching in the United States, period. What will it take to effectively scale social and emotional learning in our classrooms? A lot of the times when we are implementing these curriculums, we leave it to the teacher to teach it. Where do I fit this in? So we have to create the space during a day from a cultural standpoint. Like this is our culture as a school. The most important thing is um, a principal can do, I, I would say is dedicate time to it. Like be intentional about the time you spend on mindfulness and, and social emotional learning. So we had to realign our priorities and make the social emotional learning a higher priority. What would that look like? I noticed that the teachers felt like it was one more thing to do and it seemed things to do. I noticed that, you know, it wasn't always engaging for young people to engage and learn about mindfulness and emotional intelligence. So that led me to leave to sort of contemplate an answer to those problems. And out of that, Infinite Focus School was born. A little earlier, you talked about some of the barriers that our students and our teachers have to getting support for social and emotional learning or mindfulness training. How does Infinite Focus Schools break down those barriers? It's a good question. So Infinite Focus Schools is an emotional health platform for young people. We teach them how to monitor and self-reflect on their emotional experiences and how to move through them. And so we make it really easy to do that. A lot of the times the teacher complains like, where do I fit this into my busy day? We deliver the content in less than 10 minutes a day. All the teacher has to do is press play. There's absolutely no additional burden placed on our teachers who utilize our platform one. The second thing is that our kids are able to take that platform home with them. So if I'm at home and I'm not feeling well, or if I'm experiencing anger, if I'm experiencing fear, if I'm experiencing anxiety, I have coping skills that I can carry around in my pocket to utilize. Your love for your students and for your colleagues as teachers is, is really apparent. How does their voice continue to influence the evolution of, of Infinite Focus Schools? Yeah, so this process came, the product itself came out of design thinking. Everything that this product is was born because a teacher said something, because a student said something, whether it was verbally or non-verbally. It's this process of listening. So that doesn't change now that we have a product that we can sell. 
right? So now we're listening more intently. What features would you like to see? What functionalities would you like to see? How do you want to utilize this platform? What is most effective and efficient for you? And we take that feedback from our users and we're constantly refining and iterating our product. As Ashley left her successful career to launch Infinite Focus Schools, she learned firsthand about the barriers that black women face when trying to secure the capital to finance a new venture. As far as VC funding is concerned, we don't exist. Now, I didn't know that. I do know that inequity exists in this country. I do know that I'm a woman of African descent in this country, so I can make certain assumptions about what the barriers and expectations would be when I entered this field. So through this process for me, there's been a lot of no's. There's a trail of no's behind me, but I've utilized those no's like a ladder. Why is it that you think you get so many no's? Is it easier? Is it easier for somebody to say no to a woman of color who's an entrepreneur, or is it easier for somebody to say no who's working in that social space? Traditionally, people are just not used to funding black women. That is a pattern. In the same way we can have within us the pattern of anger and operation. We can have a pattern of not seeing people clearly through generations. So that's a pattern that I have to confront every time I go into a room. I'm dealing with that pattern. In my lesson for funders who are white or not white, but who operate within this paradigm of white supremacy in the United States is to do your work. Don't ask me to do your work or to teach you about systemic racism or about that 0.27% of black women who get funding because the statistics, the facts are there. Open your eyes and see. You have to do your work by confronting within yourself whatever feels like resistance to what is, to the facts you know, of black excellence, of, of black talent. It's here, it's in this city. Baltimore is so talented. There's so much talent in Baltimore City. Give those people with talent the resources to do the work and stop telling us what we need to do so that you feel prepared to do the work because we know what our work is and the rest of that has to come from the other party. So the first step then is recognition, acceptance, and accountability. Absolutely. You have to own what you're doing. And in order to own it, you have to be able to see it. I can't make you see. You have to be able to have the self-reflective ability to say, hey, I'm not seeing clearly. I'm showing up to this meeting, the way that I'm assessing this talent, whether it's a black woman, a Latino woman, a Native American woman, an indigenous woman, indigenous man, whatever it may be. You have to understand that you're bringing with you into that space all of the things that you collected along the way. And you're speaking to them through all of the things that you collected along the way. What is the, what is the return on investment of an organization like Infinite Focus Schools for the children, for the teachers, but then certainly the neighborhoods that they're living in and that the neighborhoods that those schools are in? Well, one of the benefits that we see through years of study from people who have high emotional intelligence is that they have higher lifetime earnings on. So just think about what could happen, the economic infusion to a community like this. Think about what could happen if we create more community in terms of not just a neighborhood, but actual community relationships between people um, in a neighborhood like this. Another thing is that when we talk about social emotional learning, I don't like to always put the need for it on the people of the community. Our politicians could utilize emotional intelligence for sure. Our church leaders could utilize emotional intelligence for sure. There's not really a human on this planet who can't benefit from understanding themselves and their relationship with the people around them to be more empathetic, more understanding, have less stress. Ashley also spoke about the role that personal investments had on her success as an entrepreneur and on the motivation to continue her work every day. So I have an amazing network of people. So an investment of ideas, an investment of time, an investment of belief. I believe in you. I believe in this idea. You can do it. I've had that. It took me quite a long time to get the capital, but guess what? I got the capital. And that's because I gave myself the permission to continue forward, even when it was really challenging, even when it felt impossible. Even when another door was closed in my face, I had to ask myself, what's the best next step forward? And it's just been this process. When I resigned from my job, I said, look, I'm going to take a leap. I'm either going to fall 
or I'm going to fly, but I'm going to give myself permission to go. So, I mean, the reason that I do this is because I want to be helpful. Somebody helped me. Somebody taught me how to self-reflect, how to evaluate, how to live a life, how to show up as kindness, as empathy, as understanding, as perseverance, as grace. You know, somebody taught me how to do that. They saw that in me. So I want to share that with as many young people as possible. Ashley concluded with a compelling vision for the growth of her idea that began right here in Southwest Baltimore. This pr product will one day be in Kenya, in Swahili. Kids in Argentina will be utilizing this in Spanish. It will crisscross the planet wherever they are. And our goal is really just to be helpful and to help our young people live the lives that they deserve and to not feel handicapped or confined by normal human circumstances.
the, the resources that these neighborhoods need have been going to, you know, more affluent areas in Baltimore that predominantly are white areas that benefit people that don't look like me. And what are the ways that Baltimore Homes is helping to undo some of these historical structures? So a few different ways, starting by educating the volunteers that come and help us build and just talking to people about redlining and understanding the impact of it. But more importantly, um, continuing to do things that help to bring resources back to those neighborhoods, including urban gardens, addressing blight and vacancy, talking to the community as well as, you know, district and city organizers. What are some of the institutional practices or laws that are keeping small smart homes and your villagers from attaining those things? Yeah, so there's quite a few things. Um, if we were to start with like policy and zoning, um, tiny homes aren't necessarily considered legal. They are smaller than 400 square feet generally. And then it's things like you can't get an ID or a job without an address. And so how do you navigate not having an address? So helping um, you know people who are unhoused or experiencing homelessness to those organizations that do offer your, um, your, your mailbox situation that allow you to come and get food on a daily basis or even store some of your belongings. So if we were to look several years down the road, how does Small to More Homes measure success? I would think that we would measure success bigger than just how many people have been housed, but how many communities have been impacted, how many families have been impacted, and really expanding this to beyond people who are unhoused or deemed to be disadvantaged. There's several organizations in Baltimore. They can also work with us to put an antenna there. So now this is a hot spot. There's Wi-Fi, there's urban garden, there's housing, which leads toward workforce development. So it's so much bigger than just providing a house for someone who is unhoused. It's teaching a whole community how to be sustainable and how to be their own little ecosystem. How do your villagers impact small to more home success and the impact that you are all having uh, in the neighborhood and the community you should serve? Their, their input is incredibly valuable. Um, when we first started, you know, it was all an idea of everybody needs housing, everybody wants housing. But when we began to get the feedback from the community, they're like, we need more lights. We need to be able to see more. The doors need to be bigger. So we rearranged our doors so that it's now a hutch and the top part is a window. But those are the things that we need feedback. They let us know that you know, they needed more storage, so we began to put more storage rungs on the side so that people can hang more of their items. But the success of our villagers equates to our success as well. As a new entrepreneur, what kind of barriers have you had to overcome? One, working in, a, working in an industry that maybe folks don't really understand, but then also as a woman of color. People always think I'm younger than what I am, which is cool, but then they also think that I'm inexperienced, you know, and that, so it's like in this conversation, instead of you listening to what I'm saying, it's almost like prove yourself to me first, you know, so that, it, and I'm kind of used to it, so I kind of spit it all out, lay it on the line, and then let's get to the money. Like, I don't really have time for that. And so talking to people in a very direct, you know, straightforward, this is what I'm here for. I'm not going to be bashful about, I'm trying to help people that look like me. I'm not going to be bashful about redlining and what it does to the community. And what's the type of investment that you could really use as a, as a new entrepreneur to help you realize your vision and the success for, for your villagers and, and the neighborhoods that you're working in? I mean, we always start with the financial aspect of it all, but more than that, capacity building. We found that during this winter, we were targeted with building four shelters, but with winter weather, with COVID, lumber cost increases, it really changed the nature of the project. So capacity building so that we're not necessarily relying on volunteers all the time and working toward that workforce development so that it's more of a regimented and scheduled kind of build session. Is there a particular 
person or an event that you think about every day that gets you up in the morning and kind of inspires you to do this work every day? During one of these times during COVID, we bumped into a gentleman that we always saw. His name is Derek. And so Derek was telling us, hey, you know, the mayor is about to do something awesome. He's about to put people in hotels. They're getting vouchers. This is great. Well, we kept visiting this area and, you know, slowly, slowly and surely we saw people, you know, being housed and it was awesome. But Derek was still there. And we're like, hey, Derek, like, what, what's going on with your voucher? Tell us more about what's going on. And he's like, yeah, I don't know. I can't navigate this system. I can't figure it out. So talking to Derek, we realized that he had ID and he had a means of employment, but the fact that he couldn't navigate it meant that he still needed to sleep under the bridge in a tent in the meantime. So I felt like with small to more homes, this is totally a solution for those who are like Derek that are in that weird kind of limbo of Yes, housing may be available, but no, I'm not in it right now because it's still unacceptable for him to sleep on the ground. And what's the alternative to the shelter for, for people like Derek? So he was sleeping in an abandoned house, a vacant home in Baltimore. And most of the people that I speak to sleep in abandoned and vacant homes. So not only is it not sanitary, but you don't have utilities, you can't bathe. It, it's just not a meaningful or sustainable way to live. So we showed Derek, hey, Derek, look at this prototype. Tell us what you think about it. He said, it's perfect. Like, I don't need anything else than something that can lock a door, that I can store my belongings in, and that I can come to every night and sleep. So knowing that we've, getting, we've gotten feedback from people who are actually unhoused, and just starting with a place to sleep is, what Derek has told me is what is needed, and that's where I want to start. Peter, thank you. Peter, raise your hands. Thank you so much. One of the, the most important traits for a successful entrepreneur is their ability to be able to iterate or pivot on an idea to meet a need or an opportunity in the marketplace. Our next entrepreneur, Andrew Suggs, did just that. Andrew describes how his own personal experience with his father's house led him to shift the focus of his online scheduling app to fill empty barber chairs into a tool to engage black men and women into the healthcare system for screening in primary care. And in doing so, Live Share Health is helping to rebuild confidence in a public health system that has been a catalyst for exploitation and distrust. Our fourth entrepreneur is Andrew Suggs of Live Share Health. In cities like Baltimore, the most important indicator of health and life expectancy is your zip code. Racial disparities in chronic health conditions like hypertension and diabetes can be traced back to historically low economic and social investment in predominantly black communities. According to the Centers for Disease Control, access to early health screenings and primary medical care are crucial for addressing these conditions. Andrew Suggs' experience with his own father's chronic illness led him to transition his company Live Chair Health from a scheduling app for barbers to a convenient way for black men and women to receive these important screenings and care. If you have comorbidities and you have to uh, you know, purchase medication every single month, well that's money that could be used somewhere else, like a, a savings account or another bill. And so if this person is paying 80 bucks more per month, right, that's almost $1,000 a year, you compound it over 20 years. So it, it starts to add up. Tell me about the evolution of Live Chair Health to a tool to access healthcare screening and quality healthcare. I started to research health disparities, and one of the things that we uncovered is um, the lack of access and the distrust of the medical system or the, the, the healthcare system for African American men and women. And so, because the healthcare system couldn't reach people that looked like my father, 
this led to him and others that looked like him having these, these conditions. And so we wanted to do something about it, and we had an epiphany, and we said, where could we access African-American men? And then a light bulb went off, and, the, and we said, the barbershop that you're serving right now with this platform. One of the key things for men like your dad is to have these important conversations so that they can identify these emerging illnesses before they get too far down the road. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's, it's all about access and being more preventative and proactive versus reactive. And so if we can you know, get someone a blood pressure screening at 29, um, and they are you know, hypertension stage one or maybe stage two, and through our program, give them the tools and the resources to manage and, 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 and uh, prevent that from exacerbating, then we will be able to level the playing field in terms of uh, making healthcare more uh, equitable for all people. Andrew described the importance of these trusted barber chair conversations that have grown right alongside the barber's historic role as an entrepreneur in black communities. Not too many people do you allow in your personal space besides your significant other, maybe your child, um, your grandmother, of course, and your barber or your minister. And so it's, it's a very, um, it's a personal space and giving people or a person um, that proximity over a number of years, that, that really builds the trust and the uh, confidence that one has in sharing information with that person. The fact that black men are willing to rely on their barbers for medical information comes from over a century of exploitation and abuse of blacks at the hands of the white medical and political establishment. In 1932, the U.S. Public Health Service misled 600 poor black men around Tuskegee, Alabama to enroll them without their full informed consent into a study to examine the effects of untreated syphilis. For 40 years, researchers withheld treatment for the disease even after the advent of penicillin to treat syphilis in the 1940s. 28 men died and countless other wives and children were infected until the Washington Post exposed the study in 1972. Because of that distrust, um, you have the adoption of wrong information or misinformation. And because of that wrong information, you have people that are actually getting their health care from a barbershop or a salon or their, their community versus the institutions that were built to provide care for folks. Baltimore was among the cities at the center of terrorizing stories of night doctors who would kidnap and confine black people for use in covert research studies. In 1951, Johns Hopkins University Hospital took living cells from black cancer patient Henrietta Lacks without her consent or compensation to create the first reproducible human cell line that researchers and companies still use today. Because they trust us, when our platform, our staff is in the shop, we're rebuilding that credibility for the health system to come in and kind of uh, do their job. And, and one of the great things about Live Chair Health is that there is also a benefit for the barbers and the stylists that participate as well. We reward the barbers um, for each client that enrolls into the program. We also reward the, the barbers for taking blood pressure readings or encouraging them to go see their primary care doctor or getting a, a vaccine or a flu shot. How does Live Chair Health involve healthcare providers and, and what they do? We're standing here on the beautiful campus of Life Bridge Health, who actually was our first partner. Um, when we made a pivot into uh, healthcare. So one of the things that we emphasize is uh, free, uh, screening. It takes about 45 to 60 seconds and it gives something, someone a tangible number to, uh, to, to take back in, in action. And so uh, a client can enroll into the free Live Chair Health program through a QR code. And so when the barbers and the stylists are communicating to their clients about the, the providers that are in our network, we basically get a stamp of approval. We are acting as that, that bridge from community to clinic. Because for a lot of them, it's the first time that they're coming back into the system. Um, I mean, we've met people that haven't seen their primary care provider or provider at all for five, seven, eight years. What message would you want to give to students that are considering an entrepreneurial endeavor or starting their own company? Yeah, I would say number one, count the costs. Um, because they are, like, you have to have the intestinal fortitude to withstand the blows that come with uh, being an entrepreneur. Um, so really evaluate if you want to be an entrepreneur. And don't 
get sucked into the glamorization of what you see on the TV because most companies fail. And so how comfortable are you with failure? How comfortable are you living in the unknown day to day, right? Um, so count the costs. And then number two, if you do plan to be an entrepreneur, you know, for, for talking about black founders, if you don't come from a safety net like I, I didn't, you really have to save. So save because at some point, um, you're not going to be able to you know, work a corporate job, work a job, and, and really um, go 100% at your vision um, with, with split uh, attention. Tell me what it's like being uh, a black founder going into the funding market to support not only a black entrepreneur, but also a socially minded venture. Yeah, so there are, I think, you know, a lot of black founders don't get the benefit of the doubt like our other counterpart, you know, the general population. And so as an example, I have a friend in, in venture and he told me, hey, you know, I've, I've seen a couple of deals lately where, you know, this company, they don't have, they don't even have a product. They just have a wireframe and they get $5 million. And here I am with, you know, four of the largest health plants in the United States, traction product, and it's like people are still saying, well, you don't have this. Well, yeah, but Every other company doesn't have this at this stage as well, but you still give them X amount of money. So not only do you not get the funding, but it just starts to eat at your psyche, like, am I gonna make it? Outside of the funding, I think the team is so important um, because you know if you're marching in one direction and someone wants to march in a different direction, um, that's gonna cause friction. So making sure everyone is, is playing to the same sheet of music and um, everyone knows what that North Star is. What is it that, that institutions like Loyola can teach their students and their network to create a, a, a cohort of funders that are empathetic and can be true partners with founders like you in the work that you're doing? I think just respecting the humanity and, and people that don't look like you. Uh, I think that's that's number one, um, and realize that there is, you know, from a financial, purely economic perspective, <laughs> there, there is there is money to be made in, in our industries, right? Not just what we're doing, but in other Black and Brown communities, because there's a lot of problems. And anytime there's a lot of problems, there are solutions, and solutions are normally monetized, right? And so I think one respecting the humanity and someone who doesn't look like you, understanding their experience, being more empathetic, and then really giving honest feedback. And so there, there's a message that's conveyed that's like, oh, okay, you do this. But then when you do that, then it's like, oh, no, 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 you need to do this. And then when you do that, it's like, oh, well, we passed for some reason that they just, they're saying they're not, you know, what's so, meant. So it's not so much that the bar is higher, but the bar keeps changing. It keeps changing, the goalpost keeps moving. And so like what like where like where do we need to be, right? Like where where do we need to be? What what metrics do we need to hit in order to unlock that funding? So are we about just like sound bites and sending nice emails and make us feel checking the box. Right. Or do we actually want to say, okay, um, this is a company that's comparable to this company. Why did this company? Why did I give this company ten million dollars, and you know I gave that person two hundred fifty thousand dollars? Like, like, what? Like, why? What's the reason for that? Andrew concluded by describing a vision for Live Chair Health that keeps him motivated every day. Just because of our presence in the shop, are being more mindful about their health. Um, that's a win for us. And so, in five years, I would like us to put a dent in some of the health disparities, specifically around hypertension first, and then as we continue to grow as a business and organization. Uh, other chronic diseases, uh, and then from a you know just a, a business growth standpoint, we want to expand our reach to other markets. That's what keeps me motivated. One of the things that uh, Wendy and I teach our students is that the best stories are honest and full of vivid emotion. Um, Jay and I certainly got that when we visited Shelley Halstead in Druid Heights at the site of one of the houses that her company, Black Women Build, was rehabilitating. Just two days before, a block of four great big houses that Shelley had recently acquired were set on fire and she had spent the entire morning um, trying to arrange to get those stabilized. What resulted was a very honest and emotional story that was not only about the development and scaling of a company, but about the day-to-day -day personal challenges of running a small nonprofit and working with the city, developers, and stakeholders 
is she was trying to create value in communities that have been historically left without significant investment. Um, I, I speak for our whole team, as, and we are quite grateful that Shelly agreed to let us complete the interview and for the lessons we hope it will teach our students about what it takes to be an entrepreneur. Our fifth and final entrepreneur is Shelly Halstead of Black Women Build. Throughout the 20th century, federally subsidized superhighways and mortgage loan programs financed the flight of white residents out of industrial cities. Government-sanctioned urban renewal programs led to the displacement of thousands of black residents and a precipitous shift in public resources away from many of the black neighborhoods that remain. The result has been a 40% drop in Baltimore's population that's left behind 15,000 vacant houses in scores of black neighborhoods in search of investment, businesses, and jobs. Shelley Halstead is the founder and executive director of Black Women Build, a nonprofit that promotes home ownership and wealth creation by training black women in carpentry and building trades as they restore vacant and deteriorated houses in West Baltimore neighborhoods like Druid Heights. Druid Heights is a historically redlined neighborhood, um, so somewhat disenfranchised over the years. There's not, there's no um, anchor institutions around here that sort of drive the economy. So very low income. I hate to use the word resilient, but you know people are trying to hold it down here. What would the what would the people here in Druid Heights tell you would make the most impact for their ability to hold things down? Jobs. Jobs. There's no work here. There's no work around here. There's no. Um, yeah, jobs. And that's one of the that's one of the goals that Black Women Build has, right? Is to be able to create jobs through teaching a trade. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I mean that's how I've been able to get around and do whatever I've been able to do, is through learning the trades and using those using that skill set. the The idea is, you know, if you're interested in a trade, that you would be able to get work after this. We have relationships with with um, other builders who are interested in hiring our participants when they're done, um, that would be amazing, but we're not there yet. How does that model make an impact on the 1900 block of Edding Street and Druid Heights or throughout you know, West Baltimore? I think it shows that this was possible, that I'm just one person and we've rehabbed almost seven houses in two years. And I just wanted to prove the point that it that it can and does work. Who is the the woman that enrolls in your program or that you work with? Who would that person be, and what would you like for them to be after they're done working with you? Most of them have grown up here, and they work jobs that are anywhere between like thirteen fifty to say seventeen fifty an hour. And so the idea is to help them basically own a, help, a, a, a home and begin building wealth, right? And, and the homes are, are inexpensive, they're affordable. We have mortgages on this block that are $350. And so what you can do with that, I don't know, you might wanna go to school, you might wanna start a business, you might wanna chase that dream that you, you've been afraid of because you haven't, you know, you, you, you haven't had anything, you know? So, so before they've even started to work, you have created wealth for these women just by the virtue of them owning their house. Absolutely. And then the neighborhood, it's already starting. There's an uptick already. You know, people coming in, the houses that were being sold for, say, 30000 are now being sold for sixty or seventy. You know, what we're hoping is that there's an uptick so that, so that more homeowners see this as a viable option to buy. What would a higher level of home ownership on a block like this or in a neighborhood like this mean? Better city services, that your calls might be answered, that your garbage might be picked up, that the police might roll through here a little more often, um, that, you, that, you, that you get to know your neighbors. But here, I think what it shows is that it's possible that you could be a homeowner in this neighborhood, and you could also have a nice house in this neighborhood. You've been on the West Coast, you've lived overseas. 
Um, tell us a little bit about your journey and, and how it is that you got to, to Baltimore. I went to law school late in life and then got an office job in DC and wanted to use the skill set I had. And law school made me a better writer, you know, so I figured I could write grants, you know. And I realized that I could talk about things that I that I was passionate about. What made you so passionate about what you're doing now? I just have always wanted to, I mean, I always wanted to build my own place and have my friends come um, and hang out. And when I returned from India, I had decided I would do that, but I needed to learn how to build. And so I took carpentry classes, joined the union, and you know, it's just sort of been a journey about, for me, about just gaining skills and being able to do it. Um, and as a black woman, I just, I really, I say this a lot, but I just want to see us thrive. Everybody else gets a lot of things, and um, I want to make sure that we do too. But this is how I know to do it, and so that's what I share. Our interview came just days after four large buildings that Shelley acquired were set on fire. As Shelley described the early success of her model, she also talked about the personal toll and the grind of being the founder of a small nonprofit. How will you know if this is a successful model? It already is. Seven houses that are basically completed and four of them are sold to the people that worked on them. Um, it, I don't know if it's a, su a successful model, actually. Um, I know that I can do it, but I, I, and, but it makes me super tired. Um, I work all the time, and that's really grinding me down. And I have another building where I'm putting a, a, a coffee shop slash, you know, small bodega, right? Where there's no other food other than, what does it save a lot? I have two large buildings on two corners. Hopefully that other one doesn't burn. But, um, and maybe that's why that one did burn, because I'm buying too many properties. What members of the team would help you the most right now? A lead carpenter. And what would that allow you to do? Uh, take a day off and actually get more done. There's been it just be two me's. And we could get so much more done. I could take a. I could be writing a grant while they're showing someone how to set cabinets. So your so your barrier to getting that master carpenter or you know more people and working with you it's the it's the labor market not the funding. Yeah. Oh, we have the funding. There's no problem with funding. We don't have the people. You know, I don't know. Maybe it's because we're called Black Woman Build and people think that you have to be a black woman. And I'm like, do you see all the dudes around here working? I, that's not it. It's, it's what we're trying to do, what the home ownership piece of it, the participant piece is black women building. I, you know, it's not like, oh, I can only work with black women. I, you know, this would be the first time I've ever worked with black women. Do you know? I don't, that's, that's never happened in construction. Tell me a little bit about your experience in funding black women build and what that's been like. Well, at first it was difficult and I used my own money and then I found that a lot of my friends had small family foundations. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> um, and so those people actually, you know, they would dump 20 grand on us and I would buy materials. You know, I didn't get paid for the first two years or more, actually. Um, so, and, and you know, and I, I had invested in real estate so that I was able to stay afloat through rental income. You know, so that's, for me, I, I couldn't have done that otherwise if I hadn't already invested in something or invested in myself, you know, first. Um, people are always like, you have to pay yourself first. And honestly, sometimes you, you can't. And you have to just, you know, I moved here and I lived on $1,000 a month. And so now funders are more um, amenable to, to the work that we're doing. And who are your funders now? It's city and state are our biggest funders. And um, we do have some individual donations. Uh, we have monthly donors. Um, you know, we'll get the ten, twenty thousand dollar check from people or a, or a foundation. But for the most part, um, I was just doing the math, and the city has, in the last couple of years, either granted well, they've granted almost a million dollars. They're not they're not granting us that money because 
they think we'll do something, they're granting it because we have done something. Shelley's relationship with the Baltimore City Housing Department is not unusual for a small, successful developer. A 2007 revision to Baltimore's zoning code allowed the city to use a court-led process called receivership to auction vacant houses to qualify third-party owners of developers like her who agree to address the nuisance of vacant houses through demolition, repair, or renovation. I made a last-minute plea on a Sunday night, and then I got a meeting on Thursday with former Commissioner Braverman. They were demoing all the houses over there on this empty lot here. They were going to do this whole block. Um, and, and he said, OK, well, you know, if she does it, she does it. And if not, then we've already kind of done some of them. And, and then after that, they were down. You know, they were, they were, they were interested in, in the work. And the city in that office in particular has been very much motivated by restoring these houses to help create markets and, and revive neighborhoods, and you're certainly doing that. Absolutely. I mean, in this neighborhood, in about three years, we'll have done 20 houses, you know? And so even if the insides aren't done, you know, they'll be framed, but and no one will be living there, but you'll have this row of houses where it looks like there's something happening. And that's important. Have you run into any challenges with investment? No, because we're a nonprofit. We're we're spending more money on these houses than we can sell them for. It's a nonprofit model, right? That's just that just that just makes sense to me. And I think the reason our numbers work one is because we're not paying ourselves a ton of money. Um, our builder's fee isn't exorbitant. So our costs are fairly low, and we're still, you know, everybody we work with is still making money. All of our subs, they're all in Baltimore, so that money's getting circulated around here. We are really a microcosm of Baltimore, right? And I think people, those houses in Harlem Park are massive. There's a reason I started with these. I own a three-story. I know how much work it is. So I'm going to start with something that absolutely will work. It sounds it sound practice as an entrepreneur to start small. Absolutely. Now we're doing larger two stories and we'll move to three stories, right? And, and so, you know, and we weren't trying to get a ton of houses in the beginning because most people, a lot of developers will say, well, I need, I need 10 houses or I need this whole block in order to get funding. Right? And then the city gives them the block and then they sit on the block, right? Or they get funding for that and do something else with it. There's a developer who has hundreds of houses and they have not, they haven't touched those since 2008 and they're trying to haggle with the city to, to trade. Or you, you, you didn't care about what was happening over here for 13 years. You didn't care, you just held them. You paid the taxes on them and there, there's no roof. For over a century, Baltimore has used health and housing codes to displace black families in the name of public health, open space, and economic development. Today, Baltimore still uses the tools of code enforcement, demolition, and tax increment financing to create real estate opportunities in black neighborhoods for predominantly white and out-of-town developers. In the summer of 2022, residents of the nearby Poplton neighborhood won a decade-long battle with the city to protect 11 alley row homes from demolition by a New York developer who, despite being awarded 14 acres of land and $58 million in tax incentives, had constructed just two of 30 planned new buildings in 18 years. Those homes will now be renovated by Black Women Build for neighborhood residents. I guess that's what's frustrating is that for me, I've said they can't imagine a time when other people would want to, that, that people would want to live here. And, and what I think is that it's a bunch of white people that can't imagine living there, and so they don't see the value in it. They don't see the value in it. And then you have people that are knocking the houses down, and so, cool, man, knock them down. Exactly, that's what I mean. There's a ton of money. Project Core, I'm like, oh, yes, the gutted, gutted central West Baltimore. I just want to see him well used. I just want to see people do the thing that they say they're going to do. And, and that's across the board. That's small developer, large developer. 
Shelley concluded our scribing how women builds black box strategy that narrative can impact on any and through West Baltimore. We're gonna get them supposedly and we're gonna put a community resource center there. Amazing. Oh, so you're going to build on it, you're not going to keep it open? No, we're going to build on it. Put a small little garden, and then there's the other corner. Um, hopefully that's going to become an urban garden, sort of, and we want to kind of create an oasis here. And if that's, if this is how I'm able to do it, right, then that's how I'm going to do it. We started that class this fall, Investing in Black and Women Entrepreneurs. I see a couple of the students are here, so thank you for coming. Um, and I'm excited to say that it will not only fulfill course re requirements in innovation and entrepreneurship and African and African American studies, but we have also been adopted by peace and justice and gender and sexuality studies. What we hope is that we will begin to create a cohort of new investors that are not only in a position to prepare the black and the women entrepreneurs to participate in the investment process the way that it exists today, but we want to help prepare investors that have done their work, as Ashley Williams described, to be more prepared to invest with these entrepreneurs in the communities in new and more equitable ways. It's quite a nation, I feel like we're at the place where we should be able to do that here. And when they're all done in our fall course, they will have the chance to practice doing just that in the Spring Special Topics course, Applied Angel Investing, where our students will work alongside angel investors and make twenty dollars to $40,000 investments into the types of companies that you saw here in the films that come from our recently raised $250,000 Loyola Angels Fund. The application for that course is now open. It runs through October 19th, just ahead of course registration. Uh, the following week, and you can pick up more information um, on that if you're interested outside on the table uh, if your students were signed in. Um, we mentioned earlier our support from the American Jesuit Business School deans. Um, they funded this and other projects to create materials to support their new inspirational paradigm in Jesuit business education. So each of these films is also the centerpiece of a learning module that includes learning objectives, activities, and resources that support the content and the background of the issues that you saw depicted in these films. These modules are open source and are available for free on the web at blackfounderstories.org, and we hope that they will do well and widely used. Um, once again, before we close, I want to thank our sponsors, the IHAU and the Loyola Office of Mission Integration. Scott McCabe and Pat Durkin and the, the crew upstairs for making this uh, production work. Thank you, uh, everybody, for your help. Um, Student Athletes for Social Justice was here. If you picked up a program and were welcome, that, that was them. Um, so thank you very much uh, for being here. Uh, our collaborators on the, on the project, Jay, Jesse, Father Brown, um, and especially Renito, we miss you. Um, and then our special guests, and then all of you for coming, and certainly all of you that are watching on our simulcast. Um, most of all, I need to thank the entrepreneurs who are just so gracious, um, you know, sharing their stories um, and experience in their communities, um, 
with a white professor from a quite predominantly white institution uh, who'd never made films before. So we are quite indebted um, to what they did with us and what they've provided um, for our students. Um, I also have to take a personal moment. I see a lot of folks, some experience core folks are here, um, some folks that I've been doing this work with. Um, so thank you for being here tonight. You have inspired this work. Uh, our students that are here, you inspire what all of the faculty will tell you. You inspire what we do every day. So we appreciate you having here. Um, and I hope that you will join us for a dessert reception outside. And thank you very much for coming. <laughs>